Hi, I'm Janelle. I've been traveling internationally for the last 20 years, connecting with cultures and finding sustainable adventures, especially scuba diving. This year, I'm showing you my hometown of Utah, from the deep southern deserts to the high Uinta Mountains, with a sprinkling of hidden gems from around the world. Be sure to subscribe and become a part of the culture trekking community. Oh, and share it with your friends. The more the merrier. So when you're first looking at cameras, there are so many different brands like Canon and Sony and Panasonic and Lumex. I feel like they all got together and they had this little meeting where Canon said, okay, I'll do the autofocus, the flip LCD, and, and then they will we'll be the vlogging people. Sony came by and said, hey, we'll be the dynamic range and the most versatile camera for the wildlife photography people. And then the Panasonic G5, it they're the best for like the, the IBIS, which is the stabilizing thing. So that would be good for events and festivals and things like that, where you're needing that stabilization a little bit better. Choosing your camera is going to be one of the biggest investments you will make in your photography and film choices. So what do you actually need in a camera? That's got to be your first question. Do you need 4K? I know with brands nowadays, destinations, they are looking for that 4K footage. So if that's something that you want to do, that's definitely something to pick out for your camera. For me, I also do vlogging, so I need that flip LCD screen. I also like to shoot my photos in RAW and have my camera shoot in Log. Log is where you can manipulate it a little bit better with Colorista and things like that. So what do you actually need in a camera? Do you need 4K? Do you need a flip LCD for vlogging? Do you like to shoot photos in RAW? Do you like to shoot your videos in Log? Do you need a dynamic range that's massive to do those nighttime photos? Do you need 60 frame per second? Do you need 120 frame per second? Do you care if it's in 1080p or 4K? I know a lot of destinations that I work for, they're actually looking for that 4K footage. So it's really important for me to choose a camera that shoots in 4K. And then it comes down to what camera actually makes you happy? Is it fun to use? Because if it's not, then it can actually show up in your work. So I suggest going out to your local camera store and then filming with the different types of cameras to see what would be the best for you. The next question you have to ask yourself is, what's your budget? That's gonna be the biggest deciding factor, at least for me. I know that if you have a low budget, it's you feel really limited in the choices that you have. But here are a few cameras I recommend when choosing your camera gear to start out with. First, you have the new Sony ZV-1. It's around $788 to $900, and they finally came out with a flip LCD screen. The photos shoot about 20.1 megapixels, and it has a one inch I don't know how to say this, Eximer RS CMOS sensor. Um, they also do hybrid autofocus and where it tracks your eye as well as your face. And then it's really great because it keeps you, because of that sensor, it keeps your face bright even in really low lit conditions. The next one is the Canon PowerShot G710 Mark III. The Mark II is around $550 to $600, and, and then for the three, it's around $750. It has a, the, the Mark III has a one inch sensor, a one inch sensor, and it has the Digic 7 image processor that really delivers in those low light conditions. It has a touch LCD screen, which is super useful when you're out on the go and you don't wanna be messing with the menu. It can record internally up to 4K at 30 frames per second and at 1080p at 120 frames per second. That's pretty remarkable considering for how small the camera is. The zoom goes from 24 to 100 millimeter and it's all in one camera. Um, the aperture is 1.8 to 2.8, so it also does really well in those low light situations or indoors or at a restaurant for those who do travel photos. It has an external mic option, which is really great because it's hard to capture those sounds when you're in a crowded condition on an iPhone or something like that. It also has an HDMI output, which allows you to do live streaming. So it really is quite a versatile camera. Next up, we have the Canon M50. It shoots in 4K and is a good entry level and will run you about $600. 
Some other cameras that I'll go through really quickly are the Canon SL3. It's around $550, and this is amazing if you're doing live streaming, like for people who do gaming or are doing Q and A's and things like that. Um, it has a, it is very low budget, and it does have that HDMI cord um, that you can hook up to it. The Fuji X T30. That's the next one, and this one is a really high quality camera for the price point it's at, which is around $900. It's small, it can fit in your pocket, and it's great for compact traveling and portraits because of the eye autofocus. It's also great for low light footage and filming, and shoots in 4K up to 30 frames per second, has the ability to have an external microphone as well. The next camera I want to talk about is a really good starter camera for if you have kids or anyone else in your family that's looking into getting started in photography or filming. It's the Sony A6400. It runs around $900 for the body. It is a mirrorless camera with an APS-C interchangeable lens. Um, it has real-time autofocus at 0.2 seconds. It shoots in 4K, and then it also has E-mount compatibility with cameras, um, which is really great for interchanging, upgrading the body. It has the ability to do 11 frames per second for continuous shooting, and has around 24.2 megapixels for your photos, which is really great for being able to blow that photo up if you do prints up until like an eight and a half by 11. All right, this next section is for those with a moderate budget. The first camera I want to go over is a great starter camera when you're looking to upgrade from those pocket cameras. It is the Canon RP. This camera is great. It's $900 to $1,100 just for the body, but to upgrade to the package, it's only going to run you $1,200 to $1,300. It shoots in 26.2 millipixels. Uh, megapixel and it is a full frame camera. It can shoot 4K and full HD. It uses the RF mount, which means you can buy an EF adapter, which will also fit your ESOR Canon camera should you decide to upgrade that body. The next camera I want to talk about is actually my first real camera, and this is the Sony RX10 Mach 4. This camera is amazing. I have used it on so many travel um, assignments and my own uh, travels and it has captured and done everything that I've wanted it to do. The reason I love this camera so much is because it is a 24 to 600 millimeter lens and it's a point and shoot. I've never heard of something like that. It has around 20 megapixels and, the, and also has a bulb option if you wanted to get those star trails at night when you're doing galaxy photos. It does do slow motion, but it's only in about four to five second increments. Um, it has an autofocus on it, not as good as Canon, but it's adequate. It does have the smooth zoom, which is really great when you're trying to capture those quick shots like I was trying to do um, a shot of inside of a boat and then there was a ram at the top of a cliff and I was still able to get the shot. Um, it does not shoot in log, but it can do raw and I love that it's all in one package. The um, f-stop, it goes from 2.4 to 16, so it is really such a versatile camera for doing both up close, um, quick shots, and then also with vlogging. It does not have a LCD flip screen, um, and then with the ISO, you do get a little bit of a more um, noise in your photos. But all in all, this is a great camera if you're looking to get into travel photography. The next camera I want to talk about is the Sony A7R4. It will run you around $3,500 to $3,900 just for the body of the camera. 
it does shoot photos in 61 megapixels so that's great if you're doing you know uh, huge prints like for an art gallery or something it does shoot in te at 10 frames per second which is great if you're trying to capture wildlife photography and it does do quite a bit of crop on the video shooting mode um, but it has a great autofocus at 567 points of autofocus and 425 contrast points throughout the photo which gives it this amazing 15 stop dynamic range it has the Bions X processor, which allows you to get noise reduction in real time, which is amazing if you're doing those low light photography shots or trying to get galaxy shots. And it's also great for wildlife photography. For me, my budget doesn't quite allow me to spend that much money just on the body of a camera that tends to rotate through every year. Um, it does have a housing for the Sony camera if you are looking to use it in those low light level situations like underwater photography and scuba diving, which I will get to in just a minute. The last camera that I want to talk about is actually this camera that I just bought, and it is the Canon EOS R. This one is going to run you around $2,500 to $2,800 for this entire package. And when I mean the entire package, you get the body and then you also get a 24 to a 105 millimeter lens. Um, this lens that I use is a 16 to 35, which is great for vlogging. And it also has this flip LCD screen, which is perfect for me. It also has the Digic 8 processor, which is great for capturing those different colors throughout the photo, which I absolutely love. It shoots in 4K, but only at 30 frames per second, and then it goes to 1080p for 60 frames per second. So the lens that it actually comes with in that package is this one, and it's the 24 to the 105. It does have the ability to lock and change your autofocus and has the stabilization with it as well. I didn't think that the 16 to 35 millimeter lens um, would be worth it, but it actually makes a huge difference when you're doing vlogging um, because it just gives that extra room to see more of what's around you when you're talking into a camera, which is great when you're traveling. The only problem is, is that if you ever want to capture a quick shot of wildlife photography, there isn't really a way to do that. You can shoot log in this camera, however, which is really great when you go into post editing and you want to mess around with the colors and the levels with Colorista. So that is why I ended up upgrading from a Sony to a Canon. The ISO does go up to around 65,000. I think that's what it is. Uh, but you don't want to do that because it does create a little bit of noise in your photos afterwards. But when you're doing low light situations in a cave, like I was just at Minnetonka Cave in Idaho, and it had very minimal lighting, I absolutely love shooting in film with this camera. It does shoot photos in 30.1 megapixels, which is good enough for me because I'm not going to be putting my photos into an art gallery. Um, the sensor is really what I fell in love with because it captures the different colors so much better than my Sony did. And it is the only camera on the market with this patented sensor because it is so good at capturing true colors, especially skin tones. So the last camera that I want to talk about is actually one specifically that I've seen used for and by scuba divers who do a lot of video underwater and photos. The Lumix GH5. This is the one if I would get if you're going for a high-end camera that you plan on taking scuba diving to do the filming. It is one of the few cameras that actually does 4K at 60 frames a second. And it's great in low light conditions and you can also white balance it as you go down to the different depths. The Fuji X-T3 also does the 4K at 60 frames per second, but in my research in the diving housings, I don't remember seeing a housing for the Fuji camera. I personally can't afford these fancy housings for the scuba diving for this camera, uh, the Lumix 5, 
GH5, um, but I know a lot of scuba diving people who actually do have housings for the cannons so that you can shoot in that sea log and mess with those levels a little bit better. But you still aren't going to get the 60 frame per second at the 4K. I'm investigating this a little bit more as I do not have the budget to buy all three cameras and compare them and the types of settings that I need for them. Um, because I'm so versatile in what I'm doing with travel photography, videography, and family photos, pictures, things like that, as well as that macro photography with flowers and food and those sorts of things. So be sure to subscribe and stay tuned. Uh, drop a comment below. Let me know if I messed anything up. I am not an expert at this. I'm just trying to share exactly my research and what I have found works for my needs. Basically, when you're choosing your camera, this is all it comes down to. So let me know in the comments below exactly what camera you're looking into getting or if you have any questions about my experience or what I recommend. So just after I finished shooting this whole thing and putting it all together, doing all the research, Canon and Sony came out with their new cameras and I am kind of geeking out about their Canon EOS RP um, R5. Um, <clears throat> it's going to run you around uh, $4,000 just for the body but it does do or can shoot in 8K for about 20 minutes. Um, people talk about the overheating capacity, but I mean, if you're looking to get into a camera for scuba diving, this would probably be the one to get um, only because when you're at depth, it's cold. It's like 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you have a fancy pants housing and all that, then, um, that would be pretty sweet. I don't know as far as the white balance and all of that. Um, and I'm not even going to talk about the new Sony camera. I love Sony, but their pricing is kind of outrageous uh, at times, at least to me. And I have a pretty good job. So uh, if you can afford it, then go for the Sony um, because they do have, you know, that really great dynamic range um which is really important when you're at depth scuba diving so anyway that is the trick with uh filming these kind of choose your camera gear things because it is always changing and there's always going to be the next big thing but you just have to remember you're looking for what works for you not trying to keep up with the Joneses. And if you ask any videographer, uh, filmmaker, professional, they all say it's not about the gear, it's about the story. So get the gear that fits your budget is what I would suggest. Um, if you have big a big budget, then go for it. Otherwise, get what you need and work on telling a great story first. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next one. Uh, for those who do subscribe, welcome to the Culture Trekking community. I hope this place is a good uh, community for you where we can interact and uh, get your travel questions answered. All in all, I just hope that I'm able to inspire you on the inside to better explore the outside. See you in the next one, y'all. Bye.